Integration Monday. Um, I think, if I remember right, we had a week um, week off last week or the week before. So, um, you know, a lot of the guys were over at the MVP summit, and I think we had Howard did the first one back after that break last week. So, um, this week we're joined by Kent, who most of you guys are familiar with already. And um, while we were on the trip um, over in, we went to Canada before the MVP summit, and um, Kent brought us over to do the Canadian um, Hybrid Integration Day. So um, at that session, Kent did a really um, a really good session about um, logic apps and integrating with SaaS applications using the app service platform. So with that session being really good, I thought everybody would be keen to see that. And I invited Kent to come and speak this week. So um, before we hand over to him, just a couple of quick call outs. So, um, if this is the first time you've been on Integration Monday, and I, I know I recognize um, a few names on the list, but there's definitely a few new people here as well. So if this is your first time, welcome. Um, Integration Monday runs every Monday night at 7.30 p.m. UK time. And the idea is we'll have content based around integration and, and Azure usage. And the idea is to give people from the product teams at Microsoft, MVPs, and the community members a chance to share some of our experience and cover different topics in this space. The um, the engagement with each other during the meeting, so there's a Q&A panel um, that you can pop any questions in during the session, and at the end of um, Kent's presentation, I'll go through some of those questions with Kent. Um, in addition to that, we've got the user group website, which has a place where you can pop any questions if you'd like us to um, you know, take away a question to find out more about, or if there's a question that comes up later on that you don't think of tonight, you can pop it on there and we can sort of discuss things on that forum. Um, also, you can use the hashtag Integration Monday on Twitter if you'd like to give us any feedback or comments or anything. Um, one other quick call out is um, we're, we're doing a lot of planning around activities for next year. So we're keen to get some feedback off people about um, how they're finding Integration Monday and, and things about the sessions that we're doing. So if anybody's um, anybody's keen to give us some feedback, I'll share that, that link on the um, chat in a moment. Um, and we'd, we'd really appreciate um, taking a couple of minutes to fill our survey in. Um, so upcoming events next week, we've got Mick Badrin, and then who uh, Mick was actually going to speak this week, but he's um, currently speaking at um, Ignite in Australia. So we did a little bit of a swap around, and um, Kent Kent offered to step in for Mick, so we've moved Mick back to next week. And then we've got um, a couple of data level integration scenarios the next two weeks after that, where we've got Andy covering some SSIS patterns, and Sam's going to be talking about data factory. So some good um, sessions coming up in the next few weeks. But at this point, I'm now going to hand over to Kent and let him talk to us about um, SaaS integration. Okay, so are you able to hear me? Yep, audio's good. We're just waiting for the screen to come up, mate. That should be up shortly. Yeah, that's good. Okay, well, thanks for the welcome. Uh, this is the second time I've had the opportunity to present at Integration User Group or Integration Monday, so appreciate the opportunity. And I'm a regular fan. I usually try to tune in. It is my lunch hour here in Canada right now, so I usually take the opportunity to learn some things while I eat my lunch. Uh, today I want to talk to you about SaaS integration using Azure App Service, which really comes down to Azure Logic Apps and Azure API Apps. Uh, for those of you who may not know who I am, I am Calgary-based. My day job, I'm a senior enterprise architect at an energy company here in Calgary. I've been doing BizTalk and integration uh, since really 2004. Uh, I've been part of the MVP program since 2008. Uh, you'll find me in other communities, whether it's writing, blogging, speaking, and I guess a few months ago I started doing some writing for InfoQ as a cloud editor. So you can look for some of my work there as well. Today here's the agenda that I want to go through. Just want to level set on what SaaS is. It's a bit of a, a loaded term. We'll talk a little bit about some popular SaaS platforms, challenges, uh, why people want to introduce SaaS. We'll then talk about some integration approaches. Then we'll dive into the, the services offered by Microsoft, 
uh, mainly logic apps and API apps. And then I do have three demos for you today. So knowing this audience, I will try to move through the slides pretty quickly, as I know this audience likes to get into the nuts and bolts of this and, and really dive into some of the details. So just to level set, let's talk a little bit about what is SaaS. So this is software that runs outside of your environment. It's typically licensed via subscription, and a subscription can mean a lot of things. So it's, it's typically one of the following. It might be licensed based upon user subscription, the number of data objects you have, or data volumes within your system. Typically, in order to get economies of scale, you'll find that your software is being hosted in a multi-tenant environment and there's usually some level of self-service administration. And I think these last few points is really where you find the differentiation between a SaaS-based offering and what I would like to call a hosted offering, where really it's just someone that's running your application in their data center. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's SaaS. So what are some of the popular SaaS platforms? Uh, here's some of the, the ones that I'm more familiar with. Um, obviously, we've got some of the Microsoft ones like Office 365 and Dynamic CRM. We also have popular ones like Salesforce and uh, SuccessFactors Workday ServiceNow. So I think these are probably you know, the biggest four uh, in the industry today. And more and more, especially in Calgary, I'm seeing energy companies starting to leverage Salesforce, SuccessFactors, and ServiceNow in particular. On a personal note, uh, we've implemented ServiceNow at the organization that I work at earlier this summer, so that's been a, an area of interest for me, and uh, that's part of one of my demos today as we'll get in and do some ServiceNow integration. So what are some of the SaaS challenges? Well, probably the first challenge is that a SaaS application really is an island. And by that I mean you go ahead, you put in your credit card, you sign a contract, now you have this provisioned instance of an application, you have some sort of URL that you can access it, perhaps some credentials, but really that's it. Uh, it's still an empty canvas, you still need to find a way to get data into the application in order for you to use it. Another challenge would be in the area of security or identity. Uh, since this application is running outside of your data center, there's you know, a few different options when it comes to security and identity and ensuring that the right people have access to your application. Now, some of the modern platforms um, do some level of identity federation, so that may include Azure Active Directory or it could mean Active Directory Federation Services. Others may just have a username password or federate with some other SAML-based approach. And I find this is, is particularly important for us. This is table stakes. Uh, when we look at a SaaS application is if they can't provide some level of federated identity, uh, typically that conversation ends rather quickly and we move on. Uh, the reason for it is, is we want to make sure that when an employee is offboarded from the company that we don't have to then follow the breadcrumbs to actually you know, remove all of their access from other systems. Uh, I've heard stories uh, in town about uh, a salesperson who was using a, an online CRM. They go ahead and join their competitor, and sure enough, they still have access to the previous customer's customers. Uh, another scenario that's probably well, uh, certainly in Canada, is well publicized is a couple airlines where um, there's one employee who left to join the other airline, still had access to the pricing from their previous company, and uh, these two companies did settle out of court to the tune of approximately $16 million. So obviously federated identity is an important um, challenge that needs to be solved when, when you're thinking about bringing in SaaS applications. Another one is reporting. Now, once again, we've got data that's really on an island. How do we then report on that data? Now, most mature SaaS platforms have some level of out-of-the-box self-service reporting capabilities, but what happens if I want to now aggregate that information with, say, my enterprise data warehouse? How am I going to stitch this data together? How am I going to perform that sort of integration? So ultimately, these really are a lot of integration problems, and that's why I thought this would be a good topic for us to, to chat about today. You know, another challenge that is that that uh, is just the reality is that SaaS is not going away. These companies continue to grow, and in this slide you'll see some of the market cap uh, in billions 
uh, for these different vendors. So Salesforce, almost $50, million, $50 billion. Workday, $10 billion. ServiceNow, just over $10 billion. And NetSuite, I think it's about $8 billion. So these are all relevant players in the market. Uh, I only expect these market caps to c continue to go up. And I think this is why it's important, certainly as a Microsoft integration person, to start you know, recognizing or understanding some of the different opportunities to integrate with these different applications because they're certainly not going away. So with all of these different challenges, you know, why are companies continuing to adopt SaaS? I think one is velocity. Uh, really, if you think about you know, what it, what's involved in turning up an application, the vendor themselves has taken away a lot of the complexity for you. So you'll see you know, historically a large ERP or a large CRM on-premise implementation usually is measured in months and years, whereas within some SaaS applications, the time to deliver would be measured in weeks or months. Uh, and ultimately, time is money, so it is, it is important. Uh, next would be availability. These SaaS platforms, at least the good ones, are going to offer you some level of um, some level of an SLA, where there will be some sort of financial backing to ensure that the service levels are kept up. And you know, usually what that means is you get higher availability. You certainly can avoid those large, you know, data center outages where people need to do cabling and networking, and the core the core network uh, router needs you know firmware upgrade and and therefore the whole data center comes down. You know, those are really things of the past, and when you're dealing with these SaaS platforms, they're going to take, take away those, those complexities. Another one would be in the reduced infrastructure and management. Uh, once again, if you've ever been involved in a, a large ERP or CRM implementation, you usually have a multitude of environments. You're going to have some, some sandbox, a development instance, test instance, UAT instance, a Q8 instance, perhaps a training instance, plus prod. And what this leads to is, is a lot of infrastructure that has to be deployed within your data center, which ultimately is, is harder to manage. Uh, this also talks about, you know, in terms of time to deliver, it only adds to that, uh, to that project plan. Also, there's a, usually an opportunity around fewer customizations. And I think part of this is just level setting with an organization to say, hey, we're not as unique as we think we are. And therefore, we're going to go ahead and use an out-of-the-box process that, say, a SaaS application like Workday will provide. You know, so why are we so special compared to Work Workday and all of their other customers? Why don't we, you know, go and with the standard out-of-the-box functionality, reduce the amount of customizations, reduce the amount of custom development costs, and the amount of time it takes to deliver those customizations? So this is another opportunity for us to take advantage of, of that platform. And obviously, there's going to be certain situations where you do need to customize. And when you are in that customization mode, you want to ensure you have a solid platform underneath you. Something like a Salesforce, where they're going to provide a rich set of APIs that allow you to interact with some of those customizations. Um, you know, that would be another dis, um, differentiating factor between what I would call a hosted application versus a solid, mature SaaS platform. Ultimately, all of these things do come down to a cost reduction, and really it's, it's around time to value in my mind, and the ability, you know, time is money, like the old adage says. So we've seen some of these challenges around identity, data, connectivity, so how do we get there? So here's some, some common integration approaches. None of this will likely surprise you. On the left-hand side, we've got your typical ERP to CRM uh, integration using a point-to-point -point or custom coding mechanism and oftentimes this is seen as the, the path of least resistance and in some cases might even be the quickest path. The problem is, is it doesn't scale, right? As you start to introduce more and more interfaces, these existing interfaces become brittle and are prone to break. Uh, it's also difficult to get visibility into the overall health of your interfaces and you certainly don't have a lot of options when it comes to monitoring uh, all of the different disparate interfaces that you've now built. Uh, moving into the center, this is uh, your more traditional on-premise middleware platform where you might have an ERP in the mix and you have your, your, your middleware like a BizTalk server or a TIBCO and you now need to integrate with a uh, uh, cloud-based CRM. Now you are you know do have the ability to do so, you're typically going to use either a SOAP-based endpoint or perhaps a REST-based endpoint and you still solve some of these challenges, you have centralized configuration, you have centralized management, centralized exception handling, 
and you've, you've kind of gone part of the way. The problem is you're still running into some of those challenges that I described earlier around the cost to maintain and manage all of this. You know, typically when you have your dev, test, QA, UAT, prod instances of an ERP or CRM, you usually have a similar uh, mapping when it comes to middleware. So if you think about how much it, it costs and the amount of time it takes to spin up all of this on-premise middleware, it does add up. And I think also if you take a look at your cost for your first successful transaction to go through, those, those costs can be high when you think of it in this sort of a model. Uh, next, on the far right, we have your integration platform as a service, and in this case, you're going to be running your middleware uh, in the cloud. Now, you want to, much like a SaaS-based model, you have the ability to pay as you go, pay for what you need, uh, leverage an elastic platform, and in this case, you're going to be looking for capabilities that allow you to deliver extremely quickly. So you want a broad set of connectors. Uh, you still want some of the enterprise features like uh, tracking and auditing and the ability to, to get visibility into your applications, but ultimately you want a lot of velocity when it comes to using this sort of a platform. And the nice thing about this is you don't have a lot of fixed costs, so if you do need to create that dev, test, QA, even training environment, um, if you're not using those environments or you want to retract on those environments, so you just stop paying. You just stop the service, you stop paying, and you're able to, to leverage your investments more uh, cost-effectively. So this is probably, you know, a likely or a familiar screen for some of you. And, um, you know, in this case, you do install your middleware uh, in your local data center. Uh, typically, you're going to have some very specialized skills in order to manage some of this integration. And you do have few touch points, but you tend to have some, some tight coupling, uh, you know, in this example where, you know, the CRM message goes right to BizTalk, BizTalk then talks to your ERP. And I think what we're seeing, certainly the vision from, from Microsoft recently, is, is more around this idea of modern integration, modern app integration. If you've followed some of the, the Microsoft conferences lately, you'll hear this term about uh, the democratization of integration. And the idea is we want to empower more and more developers. We want to lower that barrier of entry uh, to building integrated apps. And we also want to take advantage of some of the newer technologies, certainly cloud technologies, that allow us to develop to develop, to develop faster. So when we think about cloud integration, what are some of the factors that uh, play into our decision making? I think you know, flexibility, um, the ability to turn things on and off as I discussed, productivity, we want to take advantage of things like out-of-the-box connectivity uh, to all of these popular SaaS platforms, and certainly we want to take advantage of economics and really pay for what we're using not paying for what we think we might use over the course of three to five years. So Azure App Service, uh, when we think about using or building next generation of applications, uh, we really need a platform that lends itself to this idea of a, a mobility cloud first um, paradigm when it comes to different architectures as opposed to more of those client server architectures of the past where we have these monolithic applications and we need to actually go ahead and integrate them, but it can be very difficult to manage that over time. So here are the, the different pillars of Azure App Service. Uh, the ones that we're going to focus on today are Logic Apps and API Apps. I will re remind everyone that these are still in preview, uh, so they are bound to change. Um, actually, I'm certain of that. Uh, the other two actually have G8. Um, that's web apps and mobile apps, which used to be known as mobile services. So if we double click into logic apps, uh, what we'll find is we've got lightweight orchestration in the cloud. We've got a no code designer for rapid creation, dozens of pre-built templates and connectors that allow you to talk to many popular SaaS platforms out of the box. If we need to do some custom uh, code or custom API apps, we have the ability to do that and plug them into our logic apps. And we haven't forgot about some of our enterprise routes where we need to be concerned with things like message durability and rich logging. For some of those more expert scenarios, we do have the ability to use a BizTalk API app and we can plug those in. So some of these would be some of the encoding or if we want to do some conversion between a flat file and XML file, run a business rule or even execute a BizTalk transformation. Uh, next is API apps or what's commonly referred to as a connector. 
Uh, as I mentioned, there's a growing selection of these uh, built-in API apps. Many are right in the portal today. Also, the product team has made some of these available on GitHub as well. Uh, you can call these API apps directly or from a logic app. And without spilling the beans, I think um, as you look forward, you will find some other applications that are also able to tap into this API app ecosystem. So keep an eye out, look, keep an eye open for that. Uh, we have the ability to, to create and publish custom reusable APIs. Uh, we've got Visual Studio tooling that allows us to use a, a one-click publish. And we also have the ability to do remote debugging as well. And lastly, we have an automatic client SDK generation for many popular languages. So the idea, the idea is if you want to write an API app in, in Java, uh, you're welcome to do so. If you want to write that in .NET, like what I've done here, you're welcome to do so as well. Ultimately, what the App Service Platform gives us is uh, the capabilities of dealing with on-premise integration when we're talking about systems like SAP, uh, SQL Server, Oracle. Uh, we also have the ability to connect to applications of running in IaaS, uh, such as SharePoint. We can take advantage of PaaS applications, like some of the PaaS services that exist in Azure, uh, such as um, Service Bus. And lastly, we do have SaaS, where we can talk about talk to Salesforce, Twilio, Facebook, Office 365, Dropbox, etc. So I've moved through those slides rather quickly, and that was uh, fairly deliberate as I wanted to get into some of the demos. So the first demo we have here is a out-of-the-box SharePoint to Salesforce integration. Now in this case I've got SharePoint server. Now this is on-premise, so in this case this is running within the data center uh, for the company I work with. We have um, an API app agent that's installed that's going to fulfill the communication between our Azure app service um, instance and our on-premise SharePoint server. And we're able to do that through an API app. Uh, once we've gone ahead and, and pulled the data from SharePoint, we can go ahead and send that to Salesforce. So the, the business scenario here is we've got a business unit that wants to manage their contacts in SharePoint Server because uh, that's how it's traditionally been done. Now, recently the organization has decided to adopt Salesforce. They now have a, a different department that's focused on um, you know, mobility and, and and sales and they want to be able to leverage a SaaS based platform to do that. So there's a use case to actually synchronize some of these contacts from our SharePoint server instance over into Salesforce itself. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, open up uh, SharePoint here. Uh, so here I have SharePoint list. I'm going to go ahead and create a new contact and remember this is running on-prem. Uh, in this case, so we'll just go ahead and create contact name Saravana. Uh, I think he, he lives in the UK somewhere. We'll just say London. Uh, some fictitious phone number here. And so here we have uh, Saravana Kumar's uh, record. Uh, So now we can see that we have this record set up in SharePoint. Now what we can in a minute, this actually will make its way over to Salesforce. Now in a minute, let's just take a look at um, our logic app that's actually supporting this. So I have a series of logic apps that make up my demos today. Um, but the one that we want to look at is called SharePoint to Salesforce Sync. and click on triggers and actions. And what we're going to see is a very simple workflow. And within this workflow, there's just two cards, uh, which really represent two different connectors. Now, there's a, I guess, a multi-step process in this. Because we want to talk with SharePoint on-prem, there is this design time activity that I have to actually go ahead and do. And what that is is me provisioning that API app agent that I talked about before. So I need to register that within the browser. And then what happens is there's a very lightweight MSI that I'm going to go ahead and download and run that um, in my, on my local infrastructure. And with that in place, what I'm able to do is actually 
connect to a specific server on-prem that allow me to inspect a particular list. In this case, it's a custom SharePoint list. And what that allows me to do is it surfaces all of the different metadata, the Swagger metadata. So now I can see the different columns that make up my custom SharePoint list, which in this case is called a contact. In this uh, particular uh, environment, I have a frequency of one minute. Now, if you were on a higher app service tier, you could pull more frequently. Uh, this is just the, the standard tier that I'm at, which gives me the lowest granularity of one minute for polling, so that's why we've set this up here. From a Salesforce perspective, what I'm able to do is simply just drag this Salesforce connector onto my canvas, and then what will happen is I'll be asked to choose a particular entity that I want to, to interact with from a Salesforce perspective. So here what I want to do is I want to interact with the contact entity, and similarly, we've got this um, Swagger metadata that's exposed, and now I can see the different uh, properties that make up that entity inside of Salesforce. If I go ahead, I can, I can edit this, this action, and what we'll see is we've got all of these different fields that exist on the Salesforce side, and I'm able to, to inspect the data that's coming from a previous step in my workflow. So here I can see all of, oops, uh, all of the different, uh, I'm not sure why that's not coming up, but uh, here I can see all of the different values that are available from the SharePoint connector itself. So if I did have an account ID stored here, I'd be able to select that from a list and then automatically when that SharePoint message is, is consumed and ingested into my Logic app, it would then be passed to my Salesforce connector. So a minute has elapsed, so let's go ahead and uh, go to my contacts inside of Salesforce. And we'll see that we do have a, a new contact, Sarah Vanna Kumar, which would have been recently created, uh, so this would be in the eastern time zone, I'm in the uh, mountain time zone, so it was created three minutes ago, and sure enough we have all of the data that was populated inside of SharePoint uh, is now found inside of Salesforce. So a pretty trivial example, but it goes to show you just how quickly you can build some of these scenarios. Like I would wager to say that to do this inside a BizTalk server, you're probably looking at a, at a few hours. By the time you go ahead and construct and consume all of these schemas, create all of your maps, um, you know, do all your orchestration, orchestration bot port binding, do your deployment, uh, versus you know, this is where it's something that takes you actually a few minutes to actually build provision, and now you can run it in the cloud, you can scale up as required. And you know this this particular scenario I've done it I've rebuilt this in a matter of I think it was 10 to 15 minutes. So from a, a value perspective, there's a there's a lot of value uh, to the business in delivering this type of solution very quickly, and it doesn't take a, a really um, high end skill set in order to do that as well. So moving on, uh, the next demo is a little bit more involved. And let me give you a little bit of context here. This is a, a POC that uh, we're running internally, and uh, it has to do with um, a compliance project called NERC SIP. Uh, so in uh, North America, and I'm sure there's something similar in Europe and APAC, is when you run, you know, say, power generation assets, uh, there's a certain level of scrutiny that needs to be applied to your cyber assets. And the idea around this is just to ensure that uh, plants or companies are running and monitoring their equipment uh, in order to avoid some um, intrusions or hacking, those types of things. So um, we're now under the, uh, or we're soon to be mandated to follow this, this new regulation. And what we have is we have um, an ERP SAP in this case where we store all of our materials. It's our system of record for materials and materials management. It's also our work order management solution. So if there's ever a piece of equipment that needs to be replaced, fixed, um, introduced, provisioned, that process is an SAP process. However, uh, we're in this kind of interesting scenario now where we have a mixture of, of people at the plant that are you know, continuing to operate their, their assets, their equipment. But we also have these new cyber assets that have to be managed differently. And uh, in this case, we're gonna go ahead and use uh, ServiceNow. It's it's our IT service management tool, and it's the tool that IT is, is comfortable with, and it's where all of their processes exist in terms of how we deal with 
change management, uh, configuration management, things like that. So in this case, we've got an operator who might be on an operator round, and as part of their operator round, they may need to go view equipment, take a meter reading, record that, but they also may um, do just some inspection as well to ensure that there's been no cyber assets or assets that have been tampered with. So in this case, they discovered that there's a cyber asset that's not working properly. It needs some investigation from the IT team. Now, they want to ensure that the IT person is actually going to go ahead and operate on the correct piece of equipment. So one thing that they're able to do is actually go ahead and use the master data from SAP to actually create the ticket in ServiceNow to ensure, number one, we're tracking this because we do have to report on it from a compliance perspective. Um, uh, but we also want to make sure it's accurate as well. And what you'll find is, uh, and we'll get to this in a second, is when you deal with equipment inside of a plant, there's a hierarchy, and the hierarchy kind of dictates what part of the plant that the piece of equipment exists, and we want that reflected when we go ahead and create that ticket so we have people working on the right, uh, the right asset. So in this case, I have a, a Windows um, 8.1 mobile application and we've got two screens here we've got this master and we've got what I call a service now um, screen so in this case what I want to do is I want to go ahead and select my plant and there's a whole variety of plants that are coming out of here this is coming directly from SAP and in this case I'm going to choose a plant called now, I was talking before about a hierarchy, where you have um, a hierarchy of uh, plants to functional locations to then equipment. And um, what we'll see is we've got um, now a, a bunch of different functional locations that we can actually choose. In this case, we're going to go ahead and choose the functional location number three. And what we'll now see is we've got all of this equipment that's being loaded in from uh, you know, for that particular functional location. And in this case, we've said it's a cyber asset, so we're going to go ahead and, and choose this uh, flow computer. So now with our master data in place, we want to go ahead and uh, assign this to a particular group inside of ServiceNow. So what I've got here is, is different drop-down lists that are being fed from, from ServiceNow itself. So in this case, you know, I've got a whole whack of different assignment groups, but I'm going to go ahead and choose the first one, which is the plant operations technical. I then can choose the categories at hardware, software, or printer. Once again, these are values coming from ServiceNow. I can choose the impact, and I can also go ahead and choose the urgency. So I'm going to go ahead now and create that incident inside of ServiceNow, and we'll see that we've got a, an incident number of 10032. So if I go over to ServiceNow, I can go ahead and look for open incidents. And in this case, uh, we see that we have this incident of 10032. We can choose our plant. We see the, the uh, equipment number uh, uh, at the functional location, et cetera. So now when we have someone that's going to go ahead and, and uh, work on this uh, particular a uh, piece of equipment, they know exactly where to go. So let's take a quick look at what this, um, what this means from a solution perspective. Uh, the first thing we want to do is let's go ahead and take a look at the SAP side of the equation. So if we want to go ahead and look at the Get Equipment interface, What we have is um, a series of different cards that represent our application. So the first card that we have is an HTTP listener. Uh, in this case, it's a post, uh, which sounds a little bit of counterintuitive, but I'll explain why shortly, uh, followed by uh, a transformation. So um, if you've ever done any sort of integration with SAP, you'll notice that SAP is, a very, is very specific about the message shape that's going to be sent to it. It uh, is going to use a fairly complex XML structure, and that's something that we're not going to want to have to replicate on our mobile device, right? We want to keep our, our message shapes on the mobile device to be extremely lightweight, uh, preferably in JSON. <clears throat> 
And then what we're able to do is, is transform that incoming message into a message that SAP is going to, to understand. So in order to do this, uh, what I have is the, a BizTalk transformation API app. And here's a representation, or here we can see what the, the type of message that SAP is expecting. So as you can see, it's, it's very large. The, there's a bunch of nested uh, nodes within this. And it's certainly something you wouldn't want to, to uh, put a mobile developer through. So what I have here is a very simple XML message that I'm actually um, exposing uh, via this logic app. And now you might be wondering, okay, you were doing a get equipment, so why are you dealing with a post? And the reason for that is that this is, um, SAP is going to be expecting, you know, message format like this. Uh, they, they're expecting uh, a message payload to be part of that request. Now, I've been able to work around this a little bit from an API management perspective. So in the solution, I do have Azure API management, which is going to take a JSON message from the mobile device as part of a policy, do a quick transformation into an XML document that really lines up with the message that we're expecting here. We're going to go ahead and call SAP. We're going to call, in this case, it's a custom RFC. And then we're going to get a response back. Now, similarly, we don't want to project this large, ugly SAP response back onto our mobile developer. So we're going to go ahead and once again run another map. And in this case, we've got the large message structure on the left-hand side. And all we want to do is capture the um, name of the equipment and the equipment number. So we can create a very lightweight XML message that uh, we can transform into. And then similarly, from an API management perspective, take that small XML message and turn that into a JSON message that's more digestible by our mobile application. And lastly, what we're going to do is we're going to then send this out um, as a 200 back to, um, to our caller. So that's it from, a, an, uh, from an SAP perspective. Let's now take a quick look at uh, the ServiceNow side of the equation. So in this case, what we'll do is we'll just do the get assignment logic app. So this is going to be a very simple, simple logic app where we're going to ex essentially just retrieve the data back from ServiceNow uh, that represents our assignment groups. So in this case, it's a very simple get. We don't actually have any parameters. Uh, we're simply just saying, get me all of the different assignment groups that exist. And then what we're able to do is see all of the different values that are going to be returned back from ServiceNow as part of that API call. Um, then the last part of the process is we're going to go ahead and uh, send that back out through the HTTP listener shape. So pretty straightforward. Now, you might be asking, okay, well, where did the ServiceNow um, API app come from? So at this point, it's not an out-of-the-box API app uh, from Microsoft. Uh, put in many requests, but at this point it's, it, it's still not there. So what I did is I went ahead and built one myself uh, using the API app SDK, and I was able to, to go ahead and build out all of these different entities and the different operations against those entities, then deploy them into this logic app, or sorry, to my resource group where I can then use it uh, in my logic app. So we'll dive into that shortly. I just wanted to show you one more logic app. And that would be around creating the incident. So at that point, we've done a get. Now we'll show you what a post looks like. Once again, it's pretty simple, partly because ServiceNow has a pretty rich API, and it's already talking JSON. So in the other scenarios, we need to put a BizTalk transformation in place because SAP's pretty specific about uh, you know needing that XML and having a very specific message shape that it likes to deal with. In this case, we simply have a post method. Uh, we're going to then populate the different uh, properties uh, that the um, the post create or the post incident is expecting. And we basically will just align those. So category, uh, we're just going to pick that out of the message body and assign it to the category property. Similarly with assignment group, caller ID, etc. Now, in order to create this, this connector, as I mentioned, we've gone ahead or I've gone ahead and built this uh, API app using the SDK. And if you've ever done anything with uh, ASP.NET Web API, this will look pretty familiar to you. What I do have is a series of controllers, 
and the related data models. Uh, so in, in this case, I can go ahead and uh, you know create an incident. Uh, so I'm going to have a post message that represents an incident. And underneath the hood, really what I'm doing is I'm wrapping the API, including all of the different uh, sort of credentials that need to be included, the auth header, and I'm able to then go ahead and, and call that specific API, uh, which in this case would be the, the incident. Um, similarly, if we want to go ahead and uh, you know get an assignment group, in this case we're going to go ahead and do a get, and uh, in this case we have no parameters, we want to get the entire list, and we're going to once again provide the auth header, and then we're going to get this response back. And what makes this all work is, is the Swagger metadata that we're going to go ahead and enable um, as part of our configuration. And this is, you know, this is really the, the glue that uh, binds everything together. And with this in place, what we're able to do is, as we're going and building these API apps is we, we're able to take advantage of this console that allows us to kick the tires on our particular API app. So I can go ahead and call this right now. This is going to call it locally. But uh, behind the scenes, it's going to actually reach out to the um, ServiceNow API and actually give us back a response of all of the different assignment groups. So it's a great, a great tool for testing, but it's also the Swagger metadata that allows us to bind our different logic apps uh, into that particular API apps. So I think this is a, a pretty cool construct, and I think it's something that Microsoft will be leveraging a fair bit going forward. So that's the API app. Now, one thing I did want to discuss a bit was um, this idea of API management sitting in front of this. So here we've introduced API management. Uh, I guess there's a, there's a few reasons for that. Uh, one was just an additional security layer for me uh, as I wanted to um, you know, provide a, another barrier between a mobile application and my SAP system. I also need some level of agility here. So we've talked a little bit about JSON to XML. Uh, so I've been able to take advantage of that here. I also get some analytics. Um, since this is a POC, I'm not inviting other developers to the party. But if I was, they have that opportunity to use a developer portal. Now, one thing that um, I was hoping was going to work there but didn't uh, was uh, the idea of caching. So as you notice there, there was a few calls that were a little bit slow, and it was really around getting the equipment and getting the functional locations. And, and I think part of that is, you know, the SAP interface itself isn't very snappy, I would say, um, but it's also a great candidate for, for actually using caching within API management. And uh, I think what happened here is my cache had expired, and, and that's why we didn't leverage that, that benefit, but the idea meaning like my plants are not going to change regularly, my functional locations are not going to change regularly, and my list of equipment is probably not going to change all that, that regularly. So, you know, what I can do is, you know, provide a better user experience by caching some of this data, and uh, in return I don't have to hit my downstream system so often, but when the cache does expire on the next subsequent call, uh, we will get the latest data. So this is something I can configure from an API management perspective and really provide a great user experience, uh, but also reduce some of the, the stress on my, my back-end system. So I've gone ahead and we'll call this, and I'd expect it to probably take a few seconds, and then what we should see is we'll call it again, and it should be milliseconds. So in that case, it took seven seconds, which is a long time to wait. Um, but now I just you know hit it again, and we're talking about 58 milliseconds. And I can keep hitting this, and uh, you know 99 milliseconds, uh, so this is going to provide a much better experience, 33 milliseconds, for my particular um, end users. And the other thing that I did mention is I've had the opportunity to, um, to use, a, I guess I can show it, to use an actual policy to do a, a transformation between uh, a post, as I mentioned, SAP is expecting a post, but you can't cache a post under most circumstances. Uh, in this case, I really needed to turn that into a get, and what I was able to do is actually go ahead and, and turn that into a get by creating a, a policy and actually, it was just, you know, saying, okay, I'm going to expose a get. Um, I'm going to expose a get here, but I'm then going to um, 
turn that into a post. So, uh, so that's another benefit of using this approach. So API management, just in, in summary, uh, I chatted a little bit about this, but here's some of the, the benefits of, of me introducing API management into this solution. Uh, security, uh, the ability to, to add another layer of security. I can also do some IP whitelisting. I can do some other federation as well with, um, whether that be OAuth or whether that be with my um, Azure Active Directory, I also have those opportunities. Uh, governance, I can introduce different throttling policies that will restrict how frequently someone can actually go ahead and call my service. Uh, developer engagement, I, I showed that to you briefly where I was proving up the different caching where I can see you know, exactly how long a particular um, API call is going to take. I can kick the tires. Uh, I can allow you know, third parties access to that as well so that they can get a grasp of how the, my API will perform. Uh, performance, you know, we saw that with the caching itself. We were able to take a multi-second uh, request and turn that into milliseconds. I also have the ability to do analytics. I can see how often my service is being called in from where. And lastly, agility. So I now have the ability to um, to go ahead and do things like converting JSON to XML, XML to JSON. I can take a, a post request and I can expose it as a GET request. I, I just have a lot of um, lightweight agility that doesn't require a lot of coding and certainly doesn't require me packaging up an assembly and deploying that somewhere else. Here's just a high-level architecture of Azure API Management. So we've got the publisher portal where we go ahead and configure our different policies that would be done by a publisher and admin. Once we've you know, committed those changes, those, those policies, we push those to a proxy. All of our applications talk directly with the proxy. That's where our caching lives. Uh, if the proxy determines that if you've enabled caching, that's where the proxy will determine whether or not this data already exists in the cache, and if so, we'll present that back to you as opposed to going ahead and hitting your back end. It's also if you've got some rate limits uh, throttling implemented, that's also where that will take place. And lastly, we've got this idea of a developer portal where third parties or even you know your own developers have the ability to kick kick the tires uh, for your on your particular API. So. The last demo, and I didn't do this in Calgary. This was something um, we had a, a hackathon day at MVP Summit, and and this was uh, you know how I chose to spend my time. And uh, the the motivation behind this was that um, with ServiceNow, uh, they do give developers a free instance, which is great. Appreciate it. Uh, the problem is, is that you have to um, basically create an object. Um, or basically use their system every 10 days, otherwise they'll turn off your, your account. Now, using an API and actually say creating data or consuming data isn't enough, that's not considered uh, proper usage, you need to actually go ahead and, and create some sort of an entity, so that would be a create or modify an entity. So that, that could be creating a table, that could be creating a business rule, but bottom line, you need to construct something. And, um, you know, I was, I've been working on some of the service now for the last couple of months and it's kind of getting tired of these nag emails um, saying, okay, you need to go in and, and do this. And I figured, well, if I'm just creating something manually, what's the harm in automating this? And I think this is a, is a bit of a pattern that we're starting to see. Uh, if you talk to Microsoft, they're, they're seeing more and more examples of how people are building some, some lightweight automation uh, inside of Logic Apps. And obviously there's other tools as well, web, web jobs and you've got the Azure scheduler, but in this case, this kind of uh, fit the bill for me. And um, so it's called Vakna, which is, uh, uh, <laughs> is a Swedish word to, that means uh, awake. And, uh, you know, so I was sitting at the, the MVP's uh, hackathon beside Mikael Hawkinson and Johan Hedberg. And, of course, uh, my buddy Johan, probably payback for uh, the London, uh, Canada, Jersey trick. Uh, I, I asked the two of them, I said, okay, what's a... Uh, a Swedish word for awake, and he gave me, of course, some bad word, which which I don't even recall what it was, but all I know is Mikael started to laugh profusely, but um, so Mikael then, you know, gave me this term, and of course I had to, to look it up to, to make sure, but yeah, so it means awake, and the idea is I want to keep my, my API, my ServiceNow API account awake and active. 
So let's go ahead and take a look uh, to see what this, this looks like. Uh, once again, pretty simple um, process here. Uh, as part of my, my API app itself, what I did is I went and added a, a table um, a table entity. Sorry, let's get the right here. I added a table entity and really once I had the table entity, I have the ability to perform operations on it, including a create uh, or a post. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and get the value uh, I can, or the name of the table that I want to create, and then I'm going to go ahead and wrap that API call. So, so that's like all of the kind of the heavy lifting that I did. And uh, once I had that in place, uh, I went ahead and wired up a logic app. So here it's called Vakna now. And what I'm going to go ahead and do is use the uh, the recurrence trigger. So this is a, an API app, I guess you would call it. Basically, think of it much like a schedule and I can choose how frequently I want this particular API app to run. And uh, in this case, um, I really have it set for a week because I don't need to be creating this stuff all the time, but for the purpose of this, this uh, demo, I'll change it to one minute. Uh, earlier today, just to test things out, I set it to hours. Uh, the idea is that I've got um, this, every minute this will run. And then what's gonna happen is I'm gonna just use some some dynamic data to create a unique table. So there's a few different fields that I need to, or uh, properties that I need to populate as part of that API call. Uh, so label, name, application name, and extends table. And I've just said that this extends the uh, incidents table, which is an out of the box uh, service now table. And then just to make sure, you know, the idea is I don't want to babysit this a lot, but I want to know that it's running. I decided I'd go ahead and take advantage of the, the Twilio connector. So in this case, what I did is I signed up for a Twilio trial account where I get a couple numbers set up. And then what I'm able to do is actually you know, send a text once this has completed. And I basically just say, okay, a new table has been sent and this is you know, what it's called. Uh, so you don't know if you heard that, but uh, that was the text messaging. Actually, you probably didn't hear that. Text message that just went through. Uh, so now I know that this is actually run. And there's, I guess, a, two, a couple ways I can prove that. Uh, one is through the the operations view and I can see that uh, this ran at 1.23 p.m. Uh, it took 3.76 seconds. Uh, here's the, the, the local time here in Calgary. And if I want to drill down, uh, I can further drill down into what all of the data that's being passed. So this would be the data that was passed into my ServiceNow connector. And we can see the, the name of the table is this ugly UTC timestamp. And uh, then similarly with the Twilio connector, I can see the exact data. Oh, there it is again. So I'm gonna have to turn this down because otherwise I'm gonna get a text message every minute. Uh, and then here I can just see you know where that data is actually being sent to. So let's just go back and um, change this back to weeks. And then lastly what I'll do is I'll just go into service now and I will show you uh, that those were created. So these uh, these tables themselves are just the boilerplate table. Uh, I could add, I could do a, a put against that particular object if I wanted to and I could go ahead and start adding fields and do that all programmatically if I wanted to, uh, but for this purpose, uh, all I'm gonna do is just show you, these are all of the different tables that have been created, and if we scroll down, this we believe is in UTC time, so here's some uh, creations that have taken place. And let's just save this. So just to recap, um, like more and more, I think within the industry, I've seen this at other places as well, 
uh, there's this tendency for, for more lighter weight integration. And I think this is partially being driven by SaaS connectivity. I think it's also being driven by some of the, the ideas around two-speed IT where people need to, to iterate faster, they need to deliver solutions much quicker and at a lower cost. And I think using an integration platform or even just an app service platform that provides the integration capabilities is a good first step. Um, all of these demos that I built using real systems, but they didn't take overly long to create, and obviously you could add to it, but it really does give um, a lot of productivity and also at a lower cost front. Like if I wanted to to buy an on-premise broker and do all of these things, I'd pay a lot of money just to do a few use cases as opposed to leveraging a, a platform as a service offering and then using it for what I need it to do and then when I don't need it, I just turn it off. Uh, we've seen, you know, the market cap slide I think was pretty self-explanatory. SaaS applications are not going away. I think they'll become the default, um, not the exception. I know just even internally we had a, a recent town hall where they were discussing some of the, the recent achievements of the IT department and three of the four projects that, that were involved or were mentioned were all SaaS applications or SaaS implementations. Uh, we saw Logic Apps, you've got this composable surface for developing interfaces in the cloud. Uh, at this point, uh, it is in a browser. I think we'll probably see some other investments happening in the not so distant future. Uh, Microsoft, I think, has stepped up in the uh, out of the box connector space. I think uh, that's one of the things that has unfortunately uh, been a challenge with BizTalk is that uh, some of those out of the box, uh, or sorry, the SaaS connectivity can be achieved, but it typically requires a lot of custom work. Whereas now, as you can see, it's really a matter of just dragging and dropping and, and doing some simple mapping. Uh, API apps, uh, I was able to create a custom connector in this uh, instance, the ServiceNow example. Uh, not too difficult, uh, probably the easiest framework I've ever used uh, when creating a custom connector. And uh, you also have the Swagger metadata, so you have some of that testability as well. And uh, it allows people to kick the tires before you've actually shipped something. So it reduces some of the friction in actually developing applications. And lastly, uh, I would say the API management uh, is leverage it. There's additional capabilities that you can take advantage of. Things that you would uh, take you a long time to code yourself, you can just configure in seconds and uh, just gives you a lot of agility, gives you some additional security, uh, and it is a very productive tool as well. So with that, uh, here's some resources. Uh, I have um, a couple blogs, but this is where I'm typically blogging about um, logic gaps or, or cloud-based middleware. You can find me on Twitter. Also, uh, the uh, Logic Apps team has a Twitter handle. You'll find it there. And I'll point you to their YouTube channel. So every month, uh, Jeff and Kevin, and I guess more recently John, sometimes Stephen, uh, get on and do a community webcast. Uh, so you can join that channel, and they're typically talking about uh, new investments. Uh, plus, uh, they do have a focus on uh, community activities as well. So I'd welcome you to check that out as well. So with that, I guess we could take a look at uh, if there's any questions out there. Hey, Kent. Thank you very much for that. It was really cool. I was Im impressed with your uh, uni demo there. So we've... Oh, um, <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's put together very quickly, mate. <laughs> um, so we've got three questions at the moment. Um, so I'll, I'll just go through those. So.